the pastor saying that God loves a cheerful giver. And when the sermon was done, they took up an offering. And as they were passing the plates, the child had a dime in his hand and he had a dollar in his hand. And he was looking at them and he was holding them. And the plates continue to make their way around. And he's looking at his dollar and he's looking at his dime. And you can see him thinking. Thinking it through. And the plate comes to him and he puts the dime in. And his parents look over and they pass the plates on and the offering's done. And when they left church that day, the child's parents said, why did you choose to give the dime? You had a dollar and a dime. How did you decide what to give? And the child said, well, I heard the pastor say that God loves a cheerful giver. And I knew I'd be a lot more cheerful with a dollar when I left than I would have with a dime. Contrast that with this story. This, by the way, actually happened. There was a girl one summer that I was at camp, and it was several years ago, and there was a special project going on at her church, and she decided she could raise money for it by selling bracelets. She wanted to raise $50. She'd made it a goal to sell enough bracelets to raise $50 for her church, and that was the goal she started with. Her youth pastor challenged her a little bit, talked to her about it, said, I think it's great what you're doing. Could you raise more than 50 She said, that's a lot of bracelets and that's a lot of time to make them and I thought 50 was a pretty good goal and he said it is and I love what you're doing but I just wonder if you could do more than 50. When she finished selling bracelets, true story, she sold $500 worth of bracelets. Took the extra time to make them, a lot of time. Uh, just ask Sydney Stetler how I did making one bracelet. Separate story, but she made the extra bracelets put the time in not just to making them, but to selling them, sold enough that instead of $50, she raised $500 for that offering. Her youth pastor asked her, of course, why did you decide to do that? You know, I didn't challenge you to that big of a number. Why did you go that far? Why did you put all that time and effort into it? And she said, I thought about it, and I decided I didn't want to just give an offering. I wanted to give my best to God. True story. You think about those two attitudes, and I think it's funny sometimes how in children we see some of our own attitude reflected. Whether we want to admit that or not, it was the same with the children up here this morning. That was great. Can I get a volunteer? Okay, there's money involved. Yeah, I'd like to volunteer. Okay? Or maybe we have the attitude like, okay, God loves a cheerful giver, and we wouldn't say it, but we feel better when we give enough to say we've given and we can hold on to a lot more, that attitude, we can see it reflected in children and we can also see reflected in children the attitude that says, I want to give God my best. I think it's funny how we can see those things. Children make them plain, but those are in our hearts and our minds as well. I know for my life, I can say that there's a connection between how much I recognize that I have and how much that I'm thankful for that. So when I look around and I think about what I want to give, if I'm thinking, boy, I just don't have enough of this and enough of this and I'm really short on this, it makes me less thankful and I feel like I have less and I want to give less, but I've made tithing a principle and so it doesn't matter. But I know that feeling that drives it is a little bit different based on how I assess what I have and I wonder if you do the same. I wonder if that's something else that you could say, yeah, I find that to be true in my life. That when I recognize what I've been given, I am a lot more thankful. And then if that's true, what do you do with that gratitude? See, Jesus told a story about one time where he saw true gratitude, true gratefulness. And he lifted up as a model of how we can be thankful. And maybe you've heard the story before. Maybe you learned it as a child Maybe this is brand new this morning, <clears throat> but listen to the attitude that Jesus is identifying in this story. On the way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he entered to a village, ten men with skin diseases approached him. Keeping their distance, they raised their voices loudly and said, Jesus, show us mercy. When Jesus saw them, he said, go and show yourselves to the priests. As they left, they were cleaned. One of them, when he saw that he had been healed, 
returned and praised God with a loud voice. He fell on his face at Jesus' feet and he thanked him. He was a Samaritan. Jesus replied to him, Weren't ten of you clean? Where are the other nine? See, in Jesus' time, the skin disease or leprosy, a lot of times we hear about it, it was a catch-all for a lot of different skin diseases. They didn't have the ability to diagnose and to analyze and to break down. So if there was a skin disease that was apparent, it was leprosy. It was believed, and may, depending on the disease, have been true, that if you touched leprosy, if you touched a particular skin disease, that you yourself would contract it. That was the belief. And so here's the problem with leprosy. When we hear this story, just to give you some of the background, here's the problem with leprosy. It wasn't just that you were ill. I mean, once you had leprosy, there was something going on, and that's true. But that wasn't it. That wasn't bad enough. What happened was you would be forced to live outside of your home. You didn't want to spread it to anyone, and they didn't want you to spread it, so you couldn't live in your home. If you were a leper, you weren't living in your home anymore. But in Jesus' time, you had homes collected together, usually in an area that was surrounded by a wall to mark off that area to keep it safe, different times than we live in today, although you pass some gated communities nonetheless. You couldn't just be around. So you couldn't be in the home. You couldn't be in that town. Because you were a threat. You were a possible carrier of the disease and others could get it. And so you were outside the community, outside the literal walls of that area. You can see how you'd feel isolated. It wasn't bad enough that you had this disease. Now with the disease, you couldn't be living around the other people. That's pretty bad. You can see how you'd feel alone, but that's not all. Once you lived outside your home and your community, once you were outside the city gates, you weren't just separated from people, you were separated from society because when people walked from town to town as Jesus was doing, you couldn't be in the way of the people walking because if you wanted to welcome people into your village or if people were coming out of your village and you were right there at the gates, well, that was a problem. You were going to come in contact with them again. So you had to set yourself off of the main roads or if you were on the main roads, you had to cry out in a loud voice, just as it tells us these lepers did when they saw Jesus, you'd have to declare yourself unclean. You'd have to cry, unclean, unclean, or leprosy, warning the others to get away. There's no way in the world you're going to shake hands and be friendly or whatever the custom was in that day. You're not living in your home. You're not living in the city. You can't be in contact with other people because you have to warn them as they approach. I'm unclean. Imagine how cut off you'd feel. Imagine if you couldn't live in your house, you weren't allowed in town, they didn't want you in another town, and along the main roads, if there were anybody you happened to pass by, you had to warn them, I'm unclean, get away. Here's maybe the worst part. When you had leprosy, and again, it was probably a misconception of the day, but you were also religiously unclean. You could not enter the temple and worship. Of course, you couldn't enter the temple anyway because you'd be around people. You couldn't go to the place designated for worship if you had leprosy, if you had a skin disease. You couldn't come before God. You couldn't be around others. You couldn't interact with others. So where did you go? You could be around other lepers and that was about it. The equivalent of being in like a homeless uh, society today. That was it. So leprosy, yes, you were sick, and that was bad enough. Whatever they were afflicted with on their skin, that was one thing, but it was truly the isolation from the other people. The isolation from God, it felt like. Can you imagine living in that way? So Jesus is walking between two towns, when he sees these lepers in the distance and they try to warn him, hey, we're unclean, we're unclean, but they see it's Jesus, right? Maybe there's just hope. Maybe. <clears throat> they can't approach him. The laws don't allow that and they know they're unclean, but they know it's Jesus and they cry out, Jesus, heal us. Jesus, have mercy on us. That's their cry, is have mercy on us. So desperate for interaction. So desperate 
to be made whole again and restored to so much of their lives that's missing. Jesus, have mercy on us. And so Jesus, in typical Jesus manner, just kind of, I don't know what transpired. Maybe he just kind of did that motion and they were fixed. Maybe he prayed over them. We don't know. But in an instant, he said, go and show yourselves to the local priest. In other words, get approval that you can be a part of things again. And as they looked down, their skin was healed. Jesus had mercy on them in the biggest way. He completely healed them. They can go back to their family. They can go back to their houses. They can go back to their community. They can be in contact with others. They can worship again. And Jesus commands them, go and show yourselves to the priest, right? Nine of them run off. And the one, you can imagine, just looking at his skin, just in disbelief. Again, put yourself there. Imagine that you were cut off. You were plagued in that way and you're healed. And he falls at Jesus' feet. He doesn't just say, hey, thanks, I'm off. I'm seeing the priest. He falls at Jesus' feet. And in the same loud voice that he probably said, unclean, have mercy on us, Jesus, he cries out with thanks. As he falls at Jesus' feet, he cries out with praise and thank you. And what was the key thing in that passage? There were 10 of them that were healed. One comes back and says, thank you. And Jesus notes that. Weren't there 10 of you that healed? Where are the other nine? And it leaves the question there. I think they leave the question for a reason. I think it's to say that that parable applies to us today. It applied to the ten lepers in that situation. It applied to that generation. It's applied to the generation since, and it applies to us today. We fail to recognize all we've been given, and therefore we don't properly thank God for what we have. And think about it for a minute. All of the things that they were missing out on, those lepers, all of those things that were cut out of their life because they happened to have a disease, they were missing all of that. And yet when it was all restored to them, you'd think thank you would just flow out of their mouths. Thank you would just be oozing from them. One. One of them stopped and thanked God for what they had. For us today, our very lives in themselves are gifts. The lives that we have are gifts. The fact that you woke up this morning whether it's raining or sunny or warmer than you'd like or colder than you'd like, today is a gift and you're living it. Your parents, or for parents, your children, your neighbors, your loved ones, family, friends, those are gifts that you have. Our bodies, the fact that we are physically well, the ability to do, the ability to get around, and some of you know very much what it's like not to be well but the fact that you are and you're able to be here, to be alive again, to wake up, the homes that we live in, the shelter that we have. That was some intense wind and rain that came through yesterday, a little bit of lightning. How many of you were outside? The homes that we have, the places, sorry about that. We can go for food. We have water readily available to us, and we have so much more than that. You know how many fast food restaurants are down the road? But nonetheless, we have the basic necessities of nothing else, food and water. The ability to work, to have a meaningful life, to earn an income. The ability to play, to recreate, and create new things. The freedoms that we enjoy specific to this nation. The security we have. The freedom to worship. A God who welcomes us and allows us to choose, think about the amount of choice that we have in churches. There's every flavor under the sun plus one in churches. If you don't like this one, and I can't understand that personally, you can find within a 10-mile radius every brand of church you'd ever want to look for. But we're free to do that. We're free not only to worship, but to find worship that's suitable to us. The ground we walk on, hills, fields, rivers, the very air that we breathe. God gave us minds to think about complex issues and gave us a free will to make complex choices. God has given us unconditional and never-ending love through Jesus Christ. 
All of those are good things. All of those are gifts from God. So when someone gives your child a gift, or when you were a child and someone gave you a gift, what happened with your parents or as parents, what do you do? What's the first thing that you do? Yeah, tell them thank you. Okay, young children, you got to instruct them. Like they just gave you candy. Say thank you. Okay, thank you. Later in life, hey, they just gave you a gift. Did you remember to thank them? Yeah, I remembered. <coughs> I harp on my children all the time about this, and I think they've got it now. And I think sometimes I really embarrass them. I'm like, did you remember to say, they're like, three times, Dad. I said, thank you three times because I knew you'd ask, and then you asked. But nonetheless, we teach this to our children. We are all children of God. Do we say thank you for the things that we've been given? Do we recognize all that we have? Do we appreciate it? Do we know what a gift is? And do we thank God for it? God has given richly to us. We can simply stop and say thank you, and I think that's a step more than we normally take. But beyond that, for the things that we have, we can give a thank you back to God. We can give a very tangible and real thing in a tithe as a way of saying, God, you've provided. You've given me all that I have. There is so much I have to say thank you for, God. A tithe is a practical, and tangible way of saying thank you. And when I talk about tithing, when I talk about giving, I stand up here and in preparation I'm in my office and I think and I feel it can feel heavy-handed. It can feel guilt-driven. It can feel like I'm bringing the club to church this morning and you notice no club. But it can feel that way to me. But in all seriousness, I would encourage you to tithe. I would encourage you to give as a way of saying thank you. Not because you have to. Not because, oh, the pastor laid it on heavy this morning. Now i got to get my wallet out. Did you know I carried a Viking's wallet? Now i got to give to the church. Oh, I hate when he talks about tithing. You can do that. Or you can look at it a different way, and I touched on this last week. You can say, what's in my heart? And if you don't know, maybe it's time to do an assessment. Like, What's in my heart? How much do I have? Have I been grateful for that? Have I appreciated? Have I noticed? Have I taken inventory and said, I want to thank God? Or when you look all that over, does it leave you cold? I'd rather that you give not because I'm preaching the sermon series on it. I'd rather you give because you are so glad for all that you have that you recognize giving back to God is one simple thing I can do. <coughs> I'd rather you give out of joy. And that was our biblical focus for this morning. 2 Corinthians 9, verse 7. Each of you should give what you've decided in your heart to give. Not reluctantly. Not out of compulsion. Because God loves a cheerful giver. And I think if I'm practical about that verse, the only way to give cheerfully then is a genuine expression of gratitude for what you have. If you want to give cheerfully, I think you've got to look at your inventory and say thank you for it, recognize that you're blessed, and then you can give with a right heart. So just as I started with two stories, I'd like to close with two more stories. I read a terribly interesting article this week. <clears throat> I didn't even mean to come across it. But as I saw the title, I'm like, oh, we'll read this one. And it was both depressing and terribly interesting at the same time. <clears throat> it was on the mindset of scarcity. And this author laid out there's a myth that the average person in American society, nonetheless, that we live our lives without enough. And it was a piece from a bigger book that she's written, and I'm going to grab that book for sure, but talked about the myth of scarcity. Said, before our feet hit the floor, we begin the mindset of scarcity. I didn't get enough sleep last night. We don't get enough respect throughout our day. We find things that aren't a good enough value. And it goes on and on until the point that we say we don't have enough money. 
which usually means to get whatever form of entertainment that comes in. We don't have enough money for entertainment X, Y, and Z. But we just don't have enough. And it builds this mindset in us. And in the end, there aren't enough hours in a day. And we work on that, and we think that, and we repeat that until it becomes this myth that controls our lives. There simply isn't enough. I don't have enough. I don't get enough. I didn't get enough. There isn't enough. I can't find enough. And we live as though we're living in scarcity. Contrast that with a story that I've heard from two different people now. I've never experienced this. But I've heard this from two different people that celebrate Thanksgiving in nations like Nigeria and the Congo. Places where you wouldn't normally say, wow, I am thankful to be a part of this nation. But it is the biggest celebration of the year for them. And again, I've heard this independently of people that worship there. Thanksgiving in some of these countries, I can name specifically Nigeria and the Congo, is the biggest celebration in the church year for them. You dress up more than you ever dress up for that day. In fact, sometimes they will make special clothing and they'll work on it through the year just to wear that day. And they all practice a testimony. I heard this guy talking about at his church. You have a testimony ready. I said, what if you don't? He was like, huh? No, you have a testimony ready because you share about how God has been good to you. It's not just you ask one or two, or maybe if you get called on, you got to be ready. Everyone shares a testimony. By the way, yes, it's like a three-hour service. It doesn't matter to them because they're all grateful. They're doing this with joy. Beyond the dress and beyond the testimony, the offering time is the central point of their Thanksgiving worship, the highlight of the worship year in these churches. And whatever you have that you can bring in, you bring it in a line. There's music, there's dancing, there's singing, and you bring it in a line and you lay it at an altar. And I've told you before, but since I've heard it again, I'll say it again, the people that had a terrible year Specifically, one guy said his crops had burned that year. Like his income, done. A lot of his food, done. Got in the same line as everyone else and danced and came forward and stopped at the altar and just said, thank you, God. I may not have anything I can give, but I will give you my thanks and I will return next year with more to give. Which mindset do you want to live in? I mean, really, stop. Think about your life. Think about sure that you didn't get enough sleep last night because of whatever. Fine. Think about, yeah, there aren't enough hours in a day and I didn't get this done at work and I didn't get this done at home. It happens. I'm asking you, what mindset do you want to live in? Do you want to say it's scarce and I don't have enough and life is just, yeah. Yeah. Are you going to say, wow, God has given me so much? I mean, yes, in an ideal world, I'd be driving two Lamborghinis at the same time, but hey, God has given me so much. Because we serve, ladies and gentlemen, an incredible God. Isn't that what we sing about? Isn't that what we talk about? Do you believe it? We serve an incredible God. We are richly blessed. And for all that we can't give back to God because you could never repay God. It's not like a debt that you can work your way or buy your way out of. You can't outgive God. And for all that we can't give God, giving a tithe, giving a monetary offering is one tangible way that we can indeed say thank you for all that God has done. And I'll say it again, just as a really practical point to all of this. If you say, well, I've never structured my budget that way. If you say, I'm not sure how that would look in my budget. I've never calculated a tithe. Maybe you say, that sounds great and I want to say thank you, God, but I don't know. I haven't worked with money well enough. We have people right here in our church that would love to help you. Not because we're trying to judge you or we're trying to make a statement about you, but if you would say, what would really help me say thank you to God and honor God with my income would be if someone would help me look at those numbers and just show me what that would look like. 
we have people in our church that said they are willing to do that. Regular people just like you. Michelle Culver is one of them. Luke Mansfield, who's not here this morning, he's one of them. Charles Roth, Roberta's husband, who's not here this morning, is another one. And Laura McLaughlin, who's normally in our nursery, any of them, yeah, I've got one out of four here this morning, but any of them you can contact at any time. And they would be happy to help you take a look at how you can honor God and say thank you with your income. But I want to leave you with that question. I want to hang you between the two tensions and leave you balancing there to figure out for yourself. Which mindset do you want to live in? Are you glad for all that God's given you? Or do you just not have enough? Is God good and is God generous? Or is God just letting you get by another day? You decide in your heart. Because when you give out of your heart, that's the type of offering that's acceptable to God.